back in Revelation chapter 1, and I see a lot of verses about the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ here. Clear verses that plainly show you that Jesus Christ is God Almighty. You know, there's a lot of people that believe that Jesus Christ is just a good man, a good teacher, a good prophet, but they don't believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. So, Revelation 1 and verse 4, starting in Revelation 1, 4, it says, John, and that's your apostle, the apostle John. It's not John the Baptist. It's John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. It's John that wrote the Gospel of John. John that wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. John wrote Revelation. John to the seven churches, which we'll get more into in chapter 2 and 3. But those seven churches is Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea that you'll see down there in Revelation 111. You'll see them in chapter 2 and 3. But the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. So he said, grace be unto you. Well, what's grace? Grace is God giving you something that you don't deserve, like your salvation. You didn't deserve it. God gave it to you anyway. Somebody said, uh, grace stands for God's riches at Christ's expense. He just broke the word down and used each letter to come up with God's riches at Christ's expense. You know, you got God's riches at Christ's expense. He died so that you could get God's riches. Second uh, Peter 3.18 says, grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So there's salvation by grace, but then there's a daily growth of grace, and then there's dying grace. There's all different types of grace. But it's got to do with God giving you something you don't deserve. Uh, grace be unto you. You know, it says in John 1, 17, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So your grace is from Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace. Where do you think you get peace from the Lord Jesus Christ? Colossians 1.20 says, And having made peace by the blood of his cross. That's where you get peace. That's where you get peace with God is by the blood of his cross. Now the peace of God, that comes after. You can have peace with God and not have the peace of God. I've got the peace with God. Me and him are no longer enemies. I've been reconciled to him by the blood of Jesus Christ. But there's times when I don't have the peace of God. You see, that's what you need every day. You need the peace of God which passeth all understanding. So John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now you think about that seven spirits. And that might confuse you a little bit. But look at that spirit there. It's capital. So that makes me believe it's the Holy Spirit. God himself. And you say, well, how could he be seven? Well, think about it like this. Imagine there's five people. Imagine there's seven people listening to my voice right now. That are all saved. All seven of you have the Holy Spirit in you, right? Are there seven spirits in you? Seven different ones? No, it's just one. But he can manifest himself in as many places and as many ways as he wants to do that. Just like with the Trinity, three are one. And you're like, well, some people are like, well, no, there's three. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. Well, there's, but they're one. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. He can manifest himself as many ways as he wants. The Spirit can manifest itself in as many ways as he wants. You want a reference for it, closest thing that I can find that anybody uses is Isaiah 11.2, where it talks about the seven spirits there. And I just believe it's 
seven manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And it's just one spirit. He can manifest himself in as many ways as he wants. So seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. Now look at that. It said from him, in verse 4 it said from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. So there you got the father which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ. So there's the son. There's your trinity. The which is, which was, and which is to come, the Father, from the seven spirits, there's your Holy Spirit, and from Jesus Christ, there's the Word, the Son. Now, I want to show you a deity of Christ proof there. Notice that there in one four, when it said, which is, and which was, and which is to come, that was referring to the Father, correct? We'll go down and look at verse 8. The Lord Jesus Christ himself says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. So up here it was referring to the Father, but then Jesus Christ himself declares to be the one which is and which was and which is to come, showing you right out of his mouth that he's God. He's declaring to be the God who is, which is and which was and which is to come. So there's a deity of Christ's proof. It's all over this right here. Now verse 5 it says, And from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness. Now as the faithful witness, he is a prophet. You see, the Lord has three offices. Prophet, priest, king. As the faithful witness, he's a prophet. He's the word, you know, in Acts 7, 37, it tells you that the Lord Jesus Christ is that prophet like unto Moses. What was he doing when he was here? Giving them all these prophecies. He is the word incarnate. And, you know, he's the faithful witness. Who's given John the revelation? Well, the father gave it to the son. The son gave it to the angel. The angel gave it to John. So the Lord himself, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, is one of the faithful witnesses given John the revelation. Well, so why don't you believe it? Why don't you believe revelation? Why don't you believe it should be part of the Bible? How come people don't believe revelation should be part of the Bible when the faithful witness gave it to you? Jesus is a faithful witness. Who are you going to believe? This man over here that loves to correct the Bible? This scientist over here that wants to deny the Bible and make you think we came from a rock? Romans 3, 4 says, But let God be true and every man a liar. When somebody goes against the Bible, I'm just going to believe the Bible because I got a faithful witness that gave it to me. He is the living word, capital W, living word, the Word incarnate, and if the living Word is perfect, certainly His written Word would also be perfect. So He is a faithful witness. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. And the first begotten of the dead. And you're like, well, what's that first begotten of the dead? Well, as the first begotten of the dead, this has to do with His resurrection. He is the first person to die to and then resurrect never to die again you know you had some people that died and rose again the widow of Nain's son got resurrected but he died again you had Lazarus but he resurrected and died again but the Lord Jesus Christ is the first one to resurrect never to die again he's the first begotten of the dead he declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Romans 1, 3 through 4. He showed you that he wasn't just some regular man, that he is God himself by being the first begotten of the dead. It says he declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection proved he was God. But you got certain people, they deny the virgin birth. They deny the resurrection. 
He is the one true God. And in that, being that first begotten of the dead, he triumphed over sin. He triumphed over death. So, as the faithful witness, he's a prophet, and he's the word. As first begotten of the dead, he's a priest. You know why? Because when he resurrected, he took that blood that he shed on the cross when he resurrected, and he went up into the third heaven, and he he put his blood there for us. Just like the uh, the priest in the Old Testament took that blood and sprinkled it in the earthly tabernacle, the earthly temple. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ took his blood and went up into the third heaven and put his blood up there for us. When it comes to him being the first begotten of the dead, he's the priest. That's his office as a priest. As a faithful witness, he's a prophet. And then it says, and the prince of the kings of the earth. There it is, king of kings. The prince of the kings of the earth. Right there, he's your king. So you got him as prophet, you got him as priest, and you got him as king. As, as prophet, he's the word. You can bank on his word. As the first begotten of the dead, it comes to his resurrection. He's a priest. He's a mediator. First Timothy 2, 5, for there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. As prince of the kings of the earth, he's king. First Timothy 6, 15, it calls him king of kings and lord of lords. And then you look down a verse here in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. The king of kings is going to have glory and dominion forever and ever. Now, why does it say that Jesus Christ is going to have glory and dominion forever and ever if he's just a regular man? Because Paul talks about don't glory in men. Well, the Lord Jesus Christ isn't just the man Christ Jesus. He is God manifested in the flesh, 1 Timothy 3.16. Now, Revelation 1.5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us. Now, isn't this something that the judge of all the earth loves us? Consider this a great blessing. We are criminals, murderers, whoremongers, liars, thieves, crooked as all get out. We deserve to be in hell. We're guilty for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. But the judge of all the earth loves us. Take it a step further. The king of kings loves us. Take it a step further. The almighty loves us. Take it a step further. The Son loves us. I think we're in good hands because we got all that pulling for us. You know, imagine a criminal of this world, uh, a criminal on this world, and he is going to trial, but the judge loves him, the king loves him, God loves him, the son loves him. I think he's going to get off. And me and you get off because of the Lord Jesus Christ. He took the punishment for us. He is our advocate. Unto him that loved us. You know, love is not getting. Love is giving. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. John fifteen thirteen. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. So unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So he, when you got saved, when you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, he literally washed you in his blood. Now how does blood wash you? Wouldn't that just make you more dirty, make you more red? With regular blood it would, but not the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You needed a blood bath. 
In Isaiah 118, it says, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Now, I want to show you more proof of the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to show you even more proof. Look at Acts 20, 28. Acts 20, 28. Now, if, if Jesus, we know that Jesus Christ is the one who shed his blood for us on the cross, right? Well, in Acts 20, 28, it says, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. It said to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. It says God purchased you with his own blood. He redeemed you with his blood. That's God. So it's calling Jesus Christ God there in Acts 20, 28. So unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, well, that's God's blood that did that. And, and I wanted to point out too where it says oh, his own blood. I like how it's just possessive there. It says his own blood. He's the one that did it. Me and you had nothing to do with it. We had no part in our salvation. It's all the Lord Jesus Christ. And that reminds me of 1 Peter 2.24. You got the Lord's own blood that bought you. And it says in 1 Peter 2.24, it says, Who his own self. You had no part in it. His own self. Who his own self. Bear our sins. You see, it was our sins, not his. He ain't like those earthly high priests who have to enter in and uh, sacrifice first for their own sins and then for the people's. No, his own self bear our sins. Now look at this. In his own body on the tree. It wasn't me doing it in my own body, you know, doing penance and stuff. It was him in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live in the righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. So, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That was Revelation 1, 5. Now, Revelation 1, 6. And hath made us kings and priests. He's made you a priest, and you're, off, you're supposed to offer up spiritual sacrifices. You think about Romans 12, 1. Over in Romans 12, 1. It talks about presenting your body a living sacrifice. And it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, you can't bear your sins in your, your own body on the tree, but as a pre he's made you a priest, and you can present your body a living sacrifice every day. Get up early. Get in the Word. Get in your prayer time. Do something for God. Every day you present your body a living sacrifice. Do something that you don't want to do every day for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's offering up spiritual sacrifices as a priest. And he's made you a king. If you, if you serve the Lord here, 2 Timothy 2.12, you know what it talks about? It says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If you, do, if you suffer for him, you're going to reign with him. He's going to make you a king in that millennial kingdom when he comes to set up his throne. So, Revelation 1, 6, And hath made us kings and priests. Now, here's your DDA cross verse. This is something I, I see a lot of people overlook this one. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. So it just called the Son, it just called the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, it just called him God. Look at that phrase, it says, unto God and his Father. It's calling the Son, God. It's calling the S-O-N, Son, God. How do, you, uh, how do you overlook that? Unto God and his Father. Let's look at some verses to go along with that. 
Look at Hebrews 1, 5 through 8. Hebrews 1, 5 through 8. Now, this is the Father talking here in Hebrews 1, 5 through 8. It says, For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. You see, he doesn't call the, the uh, he, does, he doesn't look at the angels and say, This day have I begotten thee, because the angels aren't begotten sons. They're sons, but they're not begotten sons. The Lord Jesus Christ is the, John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The angels aren't our sons, but they're not begotten sons. Hebrews 1, 6, And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he saith, Who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. See, the angels of God worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that. If, if, if Jesus Christ ain't God, then the angels ain't got no business worshiping him. But the Father says for those angels of God to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look what else that the Father says to the Son in Hebrews 1 eight. It says, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. The Father himself, God the Father, just called the Son, G-O-D. Just called him God. If the Father calls the Son God, I think I'm going to believe him over you. So unto God and his Father. And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, plainly calling the Son God. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's exactly how it's going to be. Behold, he cometh with clouds. Here's the revelation. He cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. You think about that? Well, you're like, well, I thought no man's seen God at any time. Well, let's look at some verses. John 1, 18. No man has seen God at any time, it says. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Yeah, no, no man's seen God at any time. But what does Jesus say in John 14 and verse 9? John, Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Jesus said, If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You know, you think about you. You got a body, a soul, and a spirit. I can't see your spirit and I can't see your soul, but I can see your body. Well, that's the way you can kind of explain this. The Lord is three. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost. I can't see the Father. He's like the soul. I can't see the Holy Spirit. He's like the Spirit. But I can see the body. You can see the body, the Lord Jesus Christ. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He's the express image of his person. And every eye is going to see him. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him. You will be able to visibly look at God and see him. And it says, and they also which pierced him. Now what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ when he was on the cross? They pierced him in his hands. They pierced him in his feet. They pierced him in his side. Remember that? That soldier took that spear and pierced him in his side and forthwith came out blood and water. Let's look at something on this. Zechariah 12. This is going to show you the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ here. I'm just going to read the whole chapter. Zechariah 12 show you that this is, this is the Father, the Lord God talking right here. In Zechariah 12, it says, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens, and layeth the foundation of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day, there's your day of the Lord, will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people, 
all that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. Remember, they gather together against Jerusalem. In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness. And I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength and Lord of hosts their God. In that day will I make the governors of Judah like an hearth of fire upon the wood and like a torch of fire in a sheaf. And they shall devour all the people round about on the right hand and on the left. And Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. And it shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. That's the second coming. Now look what he says in verse Zechariah 12, 10. Here's what I want you to see. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. He said, they're going to look upon me whom they have pierced. Who's talking? The father was talking. God, the Lord God, the father was talking. And he said, they're going to look upon me whom they have pierced. And who was pierced? It was the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. That's the deity of Christ right there. The Father himself says he was pierced. The Son was the one that was pierced. It's the same God. It's three in one and one in three. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. First John 5, 7. That's the best way to explain it because you can't explain it with your feeble mind. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, one and three, and three and one. Somebody says, how can that be? I don't know. But three or one. So he says, Behold, he cometh with clouds. Revelation 1, 7. And every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him. Most likely he still got those same piercings in his hands and feet in his side. And you remember Thomas over in John 20, 24 through 29, it says, But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand to his side, I will not believe. So, this is going to be Jesus in his resurrected body showing up for Thomas to do the, that very thing. And after eight days again, his disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut. So he just walked right through the doors and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God, when he felt the prints of those, uh, when he felt the prints in his hands and in his side, he said, My Lord and my God. He just called the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord and God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. So they're going to, every eye is going to see him and they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him. Even so, amen. Now the last verse we're going to look at, Revelation 1, 8, I, and this is Jesus says, I am, here's you another I am, I am Alpha and Omega. Remember over in John, he says, before Abraham was, I am. He say, I am the bread of life. 
Here's your another I am. I am Alpha and Omega. That is your Greek alphabet. Alpha being A, Omega being Z. He's saying, I'm from A to Z. I'm the beginning and the ending. Just like in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, capital W. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and this life was the light of men. He says, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Well, it also said the Word was God. It's very plain to me that Jesus Christ is God. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord. If he's the beginning and the ending, he's God. And he says, which is, and which was, and which is to come. When it comes to the which is, that's present. Presently, he's my, he's my priest, my mediator. He's the reason that I can talk to the Father. Where it says which was, which, when it comes to which was, he is, was the prophet. And he was the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. It says, which is to come. When it comes to which is to come, that's future. And when it comes to the future, he's going to be king. And he's going to be the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And then it says, the Almighty. That makes it very clear. Jesus Christ is God, calling himself the Almighty with a capital A. How much more clear could it be? And it's like I said, here the Lord, Jesus Christ refers to himself as which is and which was and which is to come. And verse 4, that's what it said about the Father. So Jesus is saying that he is the one which is and which was and which is to come. So you have what you have with the Godhead, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. They're the same, but they're different. How do you explain that? You can't. There's three, but they're one. It's one God and three. Three and one and one and three. I can't explain it. That's as far as I'm going to take it. They're the same, but they're different. God can do what he wants to do. God can manifest himself in three, just like the Holy Spirit can manifest himself in seven. It's over my head.